All right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, first and foremost, I hope you're doing well. But if you don't know me, my name is Flynn Delaney. I am a master's student with Dr. Peterson down at Southampton uh, with his community ecology lab. Uh, I am honored today to introduce Dr. Jonathan Lefchak from the uh, Smithsonian Institution Environmental Research Center, or CERC, uh, as today's colloquium speaker. John has been an invaluable member with the Peterson Lab and is currently one of my readers for my master's thesis. Uh, John is currently a Tenenbaum coordinating scientist for the Marine Geo Network with the Smithsonian Institution in Edgewater, Maryland. He completed his PhD at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, or VIMS, uh, with Emmett Duffy in 2015. He, uh, he continued with postdoc research at VIMS with JJ Orth, and then went forth with another PhD at the Bigelow Laboratory up in Maine, before beginning his work with the Smithsonian in 2018. Uh, John spans the breadth of marine and coastal ecology. He studied, studies focus on community ecology, biodiversity, and a range of ecosystems, marine and terrestrial, uh, with affinity for seagrasses, which is why we love him at the Peterson Lab. Um, he has also developed and applied novel statistical methods, primarily the technique of structural equation modeling. John's work strives to understand the daunting questions of how our coastal ecosystems function and how they are changing in today's world. Hence the presentation. Uh, today's talk, um, so that's enough talking for me, and I'll turn the floor over to John so he can tell you about these coastal ecosystems on our changing planet. Thank you so much, uh, Flynn. Thank you so much to Pearson Lab for having me. It's wonderful to know I'm, quote, invaluable, and I will be carrying that for <laughs> with me for a very long time. Uh, like uh, Flynn said, I am John Lechek. I'm from the Smithsonian Institution, and I'm here to talk to you today about a couple of actually very exciting projects, new projects. So you will see some results that are hot off the presses things that nobody else has seen yet, including my co-authors. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy uh, all falling under the theme of sort of climate on the move, what a warming world might mean for coastal ecosystems and the animals that inhabit them. Eventually. There we go. Okay, uh, here we are, right, on Long Island. Beautiful. And I come to you from here, the Chesapeake Bay, which Hopefully many of you are familiar with. It's among one of the most historic regions in the United States. Of course, the site of the first uh, European colonists within North America, Jamestown, and over 400 years later, we're still around. And in fact, I would like to begin our journey today with a little trip into the past. So this is the colony at Jamestown from 1609. And of course, you may be familiar with the famous explorer, John Smith, he of the famous Pocahontas legend, who actually navigated and charted the waters within the Chesapeake and around the mid-Atlantic coast, and wrote about that in his 1624 history of Virginia, in which he described the region as something that is uh, among the most pleasant places known, with large and navigable rivers, heaven and earth have never agreed better to frame a place for man's habitation. And so as an ecologist and somebody who's interested in these coastal resources, I'm sort of curious to know what uh, Mr. Smith had to say about the kinds of organisms that were living within the region. So he goes on to describe various kinds of things, some of which are familiar, uh, some of which are very confusing to me. Uh, for example, here we have crevices, uh, I'm not quite sure what these organisms are, but they should impress upon you that indeed this was a flourishing ecosystem. And at the time it was written, you could walk across the James River on the backs of sturgeons, and that the oyster reefs were so far ranging, uh, you could indeed do the same uh, on them. And as uh, Flynn mentioned, I am, of course, focused on a, a range of marine ecosystems, but largely thinking about seagrasses or what we call submersed aquatic vegetation, or SAV. And this is what underpins a lot of the incredible biodiversity. Uh, as well as a lot of the economies in the coast, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay and the Mid-Atlantic region. And indeed, uh, if you've ever had a famous Chesapeake Bay blue crab, say in a crab cake, they rely on their early life history on the seagrass in order to settle uh, as they come in the mouth of the bay and subsequently are caught. And more broadly, we're beginning to understand that seagrasses are an important component of coastlines worldwide. 
Uh, we know they provide coastal protection by attenuating wave energy. They improve water quality. So by virtue of having this physical structure, they can draw down particles from the water column, including disease particles. So indeed, seagrasses can improve human health by removing bacteria and viruses from the water. We're increasingly interested in the role that they play in so-called blue carbon. So some of those organic carbon particulates get buried into the sediments and can remain there for millennia. So they're an important ally in our fight against climate change. And of course, they're key habitats, particularly for juvenile fishes and invertebrates, uh, as well as other diverse organisms, including many threatened and endangered species, like this green sea turtle we see here. And so their global net worth is estimated at about $6.2 trillion. They are very, very important. Uh, unfortunately, the United Nations Environmental Program released a report in 2019, which called them, quote, the forgotten ecosystem. So sadly, they are not necessarily the focus of our attention in terms of management and conservation, although that is increasingly less so, and I'm excited to be able to push forward uh, the boundaries of seagrass conservation. You may have seen an article from the New York Times a couple of years ago, seagrasses are even making their way into kitchens. This is a chef in Spain who uses seagrass, uh, particularly seagrass seeds, because they are flowering plants that live underwater, they produce uh, flowers and seeds in some of the dishes that he prepares in his restaurant. So it's a real bucket list item for me, hope to eat there one day. And interestingly, the first underwater portrait that was ever taken, which was in 1899 using whatever this thing is, originally <laughs> included seagrass. I don't know if you can see here at the bottom, but I, I'm pretty sure that's Cymodocia, which is a, a seagrass that is endemic to the Mediterranean. So I believe this portrait was taken somewhere in France. So. Seagrasses have been there all the time. We're just beginning to discover them and value their importance uh, within the last several decades. So I mentioned the role that they played in the incredible biodiversity and the economies of Chesapeake Bay, which is, which is here. But I want to also emphasize that seagrasses were an integral part of what's known as the Delmarva Peninsula. So this bit of land that comprises Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, hence the Delmarva. And indeed, the coastal lagoons that form uh, that are formed by these barrier islands on the Atlantic sea, uh, seashore. And so, indeed, these seagrass beds were present there historically, and uh, it were important parts of local economy. There was a uh, base scallop fishery there that was valued in the millions of dollars, as there is here on Long Island. Interestingly, we value seagrasses for other things in the past. Here's examples uh, from a Scientific American article in the early 1920s showing that people would actually collect the seagrass rack off the beach and they would bale them into these uh, bales and pass them through these large presses, which would form them into these so-called quilts that were then used for insulation. So there's rumors that on the eastern shore of um, the Delmarva Peninsula, you can still find buildings, schools, and hospitals that are old, whose walls are filled with these seagrass sheets. So pretty cool, not necessarily something we value seagrasses for now, but kind of interesting. And this was true up until about the 1930s, when a combination of two things, a pandemic wasting disease uh, called Labyrinthia zosteraceae, as well as repeated hurricanes actually eradicated all seagrass within these coastal lagoons uh, for a very long time, actually upwards of 70 years. It did recover in more northern places in Maryland, places like Chincoteague Bay and Assateague Bay, but particularly in the Virginia waters, the seagrass failed to recover and uh, come back to these coastal areas. And I thought this was a particularly interesting passage. It's from one of my favorite books, just kidding. Uh, Josh shooting along the mid-Atlantic tidewater, which was written in the 1950s. And in it, um, actually, the author was recognizing the value of these seagrass systems in promoting things like saltwater fishing, clam, clamming, crabbing, scallops, birds, and that it would be an important achievement to bring it back to these coastal waters so that we can continue to exploit them for these purposes. I also put this quote up here because it has perhaps the best uh, phrase that I've ever heard to describe seagrass, long, slimy, green ribbon of Hades. <laughs> so this was reflecting the fact that not everyone values seagrasses, uh, particularly before we uh, invented propellers that didn't get uh, clogged up by seagrass. So as I mentioned, these lagoons remained 
bake into seagrass for many, many decades after the, these hurricanes and this wasting disease until my colleague Bob Orth in the late 1990s was uh, made aware of a very small patch of seagrass that was uh, persisting in an area called South Bay. And at this point, the understanding was that these bays were no longer amenable for seagrass, that the water quality had deteriorated much like in the nearby Chesapeake Bay. But after some exploration and some test plantings, this proved not to be true. And in fact, the reason seagrass had never returned was not that the environment was unsatisfactory, but instead that they were recruitment limited because these lagoons are very enclosed by these barrier islands. The, the seeds, the propagules of these plants just weren't able to slip their way in and get back into these bays without our help. So indeed, this was uh, Bob or JJ's mission over the next 25 years. He uh, instituted what is perhaps the most successful seagrass restoration uh, on the planet. It is a seed-based restoration, so they would use this uh, underwater lawnmower here, that's not to the front of the skip, collect shoots that had seeds, as you can see here, hold them in the, these large tanks until they release their seeds, which we could then collect, and hold until the fall, at which point we could broadcast them out into these coastal bays, uh, whereupon they would take roots, grow, eventually contribute to this restoration. So here they are, here's the little seeds, not super impressive, about the size of a pinhead. So many, many millions of these seeds have been broadcast in these coastal bays since these uh, very early test plots in the 90s. And these efforts continue to this day through partnerships involving the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, the University of Virginia, and in fact, uh, volunteers working with the Nature Conservancy as part of the Virginia Coast Reserve. So a lovely day. I call JJ Johnny Seagrass Seed, mm -hmm. some Johnny Apple Seed. So here are some of these coastal lagoons. You can see the barrier islands here. And these yellow points are the initial areas that were seeded. And these dark areas all around here, down through Southern South Bay, up into Cobb and Spider Crab Bay are the seagrass meadows that have resulted from this effort. And as you can see in the graph on the right, we went from basically zero acres to now close to 10,000 acres of seagrass. Again, one of the most successful restorations that we have seen on the planet, uh, which was fostered by a strong understanding of this recruitment limitation and the dedication of JJ and his colleagues and volunteers in continuing to collect and broadcast these seeds. And it can be difficult to sort of comprehend the size of this. You know, I've been on the water, I've been in the water, I had the fortune of flying over this in a, a small plane. It's truly astounding the area that the seagrass now covers, but I thought I might express it to you in units that might be a little bit more familiar. I drove here this morning onto your beautiful campus. Uh, you've all been walking around and, and presumably been taking classes here for some time. So I'd like to point out that the acreage of seagrass in uh, these coastal bays that has been restored is equivalent to about a little over six Stony Brook campuses work. So consider that the next time you're walking from one end to the other, then imagine multiplying that by 6.1, and that's how much seagrass has been restored to these coastal bays. So when I became involved in the restoration, we had a very simple question. Um, it was, Bill, this, will they come? It's a little bit of a field of dreams kind of hypothesis here. So these seagrass beds, as I mentioned, serve as habitat for diverse organisms, things like these small gastropods, amphipods, uh, isopods that form the basis of coastal food webs. They're basically little bundles of energy for fish or fish food, and their presence and abundance is a good sign that these food webs are functioning within these restored ecosystems. So I worked with JJ and others to monitor these communities, try to understand how they were recovering as a consequence of the restoration. And I'm happy to say that uh, over the course of this restoration, we have seen an incredible explosion in both the abundance, the biomass, and the diversity of these small organisms, such that South Bay actually represents among the most diverse seagrass beds along the entire stretch of the Delmarva Peninsula, even more than beds that have persisted and recovered since those events of the 1930s. So that's pretty exciting. I'll point out again that this is kind of an abstract number here. What is 1,500 metric tons really mean. So I, I like these sort of analogies, and I would express this to you in units of blue whales. 
So there's approximately eight and a quarter blue whales worth of these small invertebrates biomass produced every year as a consequence of having this habitat restored. Pretty incredible stuff. And I mentioned that uh, these are essentially fish food for organisms. These, this is an image I think I created from the internet. Uh, but it shows the gut contents of, I believe, a striped bass. And you can see there's some small fishes, crabs, a lot of these uh, small grass shrimp, presumably all intermixed with some of those isopods and amphipods that I showed you previously. So we were interested then in going on to understand what the fish community looks like in response to this increasing abundance of their food source. And indeed, as you might expect, uh, we have seen incredible explosion in both the biomass and the diversity of the fish communities that have been utilizing these seagrass, these restored seagrass beds over the last 20 or so years. And I want to point out one of these characters in particular, it may be familiar to some of you, particularly Brad, who worked in the Gulf of Mexico, where this is very common. This is the pinfish or Lagodon rhomboides. It is an incredible keystone species within near shore communities uh, within the Gulf of Mexico and along the southeastern United States. And indeed, there is a well-described ecotone around Cape Hatteras below which you get sort of more warm affinity species, including the aforementioned pinfish, and above which you get what we would refer to as more cool affinity species uh, dominated by organisms like, say, the silver perch. And if we look at the communities um, that are recovered in near shore trawls, we can see that they're more or less totally distinct from one another historically, uh, whether you're in North Carolina below Cape Hatteras or in Virginia just above that ecotone. And as I mentioned, these pinfish are a linchpin of these near shore systems in that sort of warm affinity community. You can see that they just occur in incredible abundances is in this video, which I believe is from a national park in Florida. And they themselves form the basis uh, of larger piscivores that will feed on them and contribute to the moving energy up through these coastal food webs. So it should come as no surprise to all of you, considering that it's kind of winter without snow, that temperatures continue to rise across the entire uh, Atlantic coastline. In particular, in these coastal bays over the last 15 years or so, we've seen about a 1.5 degrees centigrade increase in summertime temperatures. So we're starting to maybe mimic some of the more southerly, quote, warm affinity ecosystems in our historically cool affinity systems, raising the question of whether we might start to see these pinfish migrating northward and contributing to ecosystem processes, particularly in these restored meadows. So to answer this question, we're going to draw on some near shore trawl data, and we're actually going to use uh, data from our colleagues down at the University of Chap uh, North Carolina Chapel Hills uh, near shore trawl pro program in Pamlico Sound. Uh, trawls that we've done in those uh, coastal bays, particularly in the Restoration and South Bay, and then slightly north of that in Chincoteague Bay, that our colleagues have collected trawl data um, as part of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources regular monitoring program. And so I would like to acknowledge the vast number of people who have helped contribute to this data set, as well as the number of agencies that have contributed over many decades to ensuring that we have good data to be able to understand maybe how species are moving around. So when we look at pinfish, we'll start where they are historically uh, present. And indeed, they are highly abundant You'll see in just a moment, they, they tend to form actually the majority of the biomass that's recovered in these near shore trawls. Uh, but here in North Carolina, you can see that, uh, that they are many hundreds of individuals per 100 meter tow uh, consistently over the last 12 years. And this dotted line is the long running average. And you can see that there are particular years here in which we have, say, spikes in the pinfish abundance that are above that long running average. So I would ask you to keep that in mind as we move forward, because it'll become important in just a little bit. So let's contrast that to what we're seeing in Virginia and these restored seagrass beds. And indeed, there's much overall, uh, much lower overall abundance of pinfish in the trawls recovered there. However, they are present 
And there are particular years in which they are fairly abundant, including just last year. In fact, I would point out that in 2022, the average number of pinfish per trawl was a more or less no different than what you might find in a place like North Carolina. So some pretty strong evidence that these communities north of this historical egotone are shifting to maybe look a little bit more like more southerly communities that you would find historically in North Carolina. And I said, keep an eye on these, these spikes because you can see that in 2012, 2015, and again in 2022, we did get these peaks of abundance in both of these locations. And we had some suspicions on why that might be. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. In this particular plot, I was just pointing out the proportion of the entire uh, community that's taken in these trawls that are comprised by the pinfish. And you can see that, generally speaking, in North Carolina in the green, they're well over half sometimes more than three quarters of all the fishes that are caught in these trawls. And then generally speaking in Virginia, at least in, in some years, pinfish are a very small minority of the fish that are caught in these trawls. Again, with some exceptions in those years, uh, 2012, 2015, and 2022, in which they actually uh, exceeded half of all the fish that were recovered uh, in 2022, and almost half in 2015. So clearly there are periodic intrusions of these fish northward, such that they're making these Virginia communities appear more like North Carolina communities. I'll just point out that the Maryland trawl data, just slightly north of the Virginia trawl data, has very few pinfish in it historically, although we do kind of see that little spike in 2022. I would point out too that the Maryland data actually goes back much farther to the 1980s. And again, same setup here, much, much smaller y axis in this case. But we do have uh, periods in which the uh, pinfish abundance is, is greater than the average. And in parity with our findings in Virginia and North Carolina, increasingly so in the last decade or so, 2012, 2015, 2022. So we were wondering, why is this? And of course, the title of this talk is Climate on the Move. We suspected temperature might be having a strong influence on the patterns that we were seeing. The question is, the, what temperatures? Well, water temperatures, but where? And pinfish are kind of unique. Well, they're not terribly unique, but they have a, a somewhat more complicated life history in the sense that they come inshore as juveniles, they mature, and then as adults, they go offshore into the Gulf Stream to spawn. Those larvae are then uh, inducted into these nearshore areas. They grow up, mature, and the cycle repeats itself. So we did notice an interesting pattern that in those years where there were spikes, so say 2015, we got very strong offshore temperature now, as opposed to years when we had very low abundance of pinfish, uh, say in Virginia, where we had actually somewhat cooler offshore waters. And so we were interested in understanding whether or not the movement of pinfish and the appearance of pinfish uh, increasingly in these more northern areas is a consequence of warming offshore conditions, which is where they are going to spawn. And to answer this question, we worked with some physical oceanographers who came up with the drifter model uh, using the oceanographic conditions offshore in several of the years between 2012 and 2015. And tried to understand whether or not uh, these individuals were getting transported more often in these warm years into these nearshore areas than in the cool years. And so in this case, we would let these thousand drifters go. Here's their path. It looks like kind of really bloody spaghetti. Um, so in this case, we can, we can simplify this and summarize it a little bit. And this uh, y-axis here is the number of drifters that hit that coastal zone. So at the point at which we feel like they're likely to find their way into these coastal areas that are part of these trawl surveys. And counter to our expectations, more of the drifters were getting into these coastal areas in very cool years, like 2014, than in these very warm years, 2015. And this was true at both the surface and the subsurface levels. 
in this oceanographic model. I should point out that we didn't incorporate any biology of the organisms, say optimal temperature, thresholds for things like larval developments, which could be an interesting future frontier, but at least as far as the oceanographic conditions are concerned, it doesn't necessarily seem like they're contributing to this periodic influx uh, of pinfish into these coastal areas and consequent abundant, uh, changes in abundance that we get in our trawls. So instead we turned our attention to the bays themselves, which as I mentioned, are also getting warmer over the last 15 years. And so we put together a linear model, taking some of these temperature, offshore temperature anomalies, local summertime temperatures within these coastal bays and asking whether or not we could significantly predict the variance, the difference in abundance between these different years of the trawl. And indeed, offshore temperature was not important as our oceanographic models would suggest, or rather I should say not significant, could potentially still be important, but rather inshore temperature was a much stronger predictor of pinfish density within these trawls. And in fact, the relationship is positive as you see here, so that the warmer it becomes, the more likely we are to get a high abundance of pinfish in our trawls. So what we think is going on here is that these fishes are going offshore into the Gulf Stream, their spawning is normal, their larvae get transported in, probably in huge abundances, but it's really the local conditions of the recipient areas that are facilitating their uh, recruitment and then their maturation to the point where they're large enough that we catch them and identify them in our trolls. Interestingly too, we included the abundance of pinfish in North Carolina trawls as a predictor to control for potential region-wide uh, recruitment. So there could be particularly boom year for pinfish for whatever reasons that cause boom years for various fish stocks. And indeed, this is also positively related, suggesting that there could be other processes at play here beyond the local uh, sea surface temperatures within these coastal areas that could explain uh, the high abundance of these pinfish. So some interesting results suggesting that, at least in part, the movement of pinfish into more northerly areas is facilitated by these local inshore temperatures, but there may be other factors at play here too, and we look forward to trying to understand what those might be. So here's the interesting thing about pinfish that I haven't told you yet. When they're young, they tend to feed on those small invertebrates that I showed you earlier. But as they mature, they actually change their diets and they feed more on plants and algae, such as seagrass. And in fact, our colleagues down in the Gulf of Mexico have shown that these can be voracious herbivores. And so now there are some questions over what is the future of this restoration as these omnivorous, ultimately herbivorous fishes continue to increase in abundance, particularly as temperatures continue to rise. And I'll just point out here in this chart, uh, these are uh, each month of these years, this line here at the top shows the size at maturation. And so again, these uh, pinfish are generally maturing to adult size when they switch from being more invertivores to herbivores. So there's very real potential here for these fishes to exert some influence on the seagrass community. So we look forward to seeing what happens and there's potentially interesting experiments to be done with pinfish in these coastal bays so we can understand a little bit better what the consequences for this restoration might be. All right, so that was a little close to home or I should say closer to home. I'd like to switch gears now and actually go around the globe to Australia. And in fact, to a tiny island off the west coast of Australia called Rottnest Island. Um, it's a couple kilometers off the shore uh, of Perth, which is the major city in Western Australia. You may be familiar with Rottnest Island, even if you haven't heard of it, because it's the home to the endemic quokka. These are the small native animals that are pretty popular on Instagram because they look like they're smiling. Um, and, I've been there, sadly, these are pretty good pictures. They captured at just the right moment. They're not always <laughs> smiling. Uh, I was kind of disappointed. But Rottnest Island is particularly interesting because in around 2011, there was a massive heat wave that struck Western Australia, including Rottnest Island and other places northward like Jurian Bay. Uh, and when I say massive, I mean like three to five degrees in excess of the historical average. So this was a huge heat wave 
um, somewhat unprecedented, at least as far as we have been paying attention. And so there's a lot of interest in understanding the consequences for the local uh, near shore communities, things like seagrass, uh, but also kelps and corals, and of course the associated fish communities, such as these tropical herbivores, which were shown to be following uh, the sea wave moving more down the coast into areas where they had historically been absent, excuse me, because it was too cold, and which now became amenable for them uh, to shift their ranges and become contributing members of these local communities. And in fact, there's tremendous concern over this because it's, see these kelp forests pre-heat wave uh, were quite lush. This is Aclonia, one of the more understory kelps. After these tropical herbivores extended their range, they were able to graze down those kelps to practically nothing. So again, in the vein of pinfish, something we're concerned about with seagrass, you get these tropical or some tropical herbivores moving down with potentially disastrous consequences for those foundational ecosystems. So I have been working for a long time, sorry. I've been working for a long time with colleagues uh, as part of the Reef Life Survey Network. This is a program that was started by Graham Edgar and Rick Stewart Smith, run out of the University of Tasmania, the wee little island here, in the very south of Australia. And they have done an incredible job basically going around the world and surveying fish communities. And of course, they've been concentrating their efforts on Australia. And I believe this has been their 10th year in a row that they've circumnavigated the entire continent and generated fish data at every single one of the points they see there. So it is an incredible program, possibly the, the best marine biodiversity data set on the planet. And so I'm, there are a lot of interesting questions that, that can be asked with this data set. In particular, uh, I have been working with Rick and Graham um, just last month, I was in Tasmania, and we were trying to understand how we can use these community data to both understand uh, how communities are changing in response to temperature, and then who might be responsible for those changes. And to do that, uh, Rick, in about 2012, 2013, developed an index called the Species Thermal Index. So for every species, we can delineate their range based on these very dense surveys around the coast of Australia. And then we can sort of determine their thermal optimum. So the air, the temperature where they are most abundant along their entire range. And this number would represent their thermal index. So we can assign uh, a temperature to each species at which they are uh, most happy, if you will. And indeed, then we can combine across all the species that are seen on each of these reef life surveys and create something called the community temperature index or CTI. So this is just a weighted average of those individual species, sort of thermal affinities, weighted by their abundance or their biomass along each of these surveys. So this is actually just a, a typical community weighted, you know, weighted mean that you might see, um, say, in other kinds of trait-based investigations, uh, just in this case, the trait being those thermal affinities. And so if we focus our attention back on Rottnest Island, we can use the thermal optimum of each of these species that are observed there and compute these community temperature index and then look at how these are changing through time, particularly in response to that extreme warming event. And so you can see here on the left axis, we have temperature 2011, really extreme warming events, which has then declined since, sort of returned more to a baseline. On the other axis, we have that community temperature index. And so you can see that it somewhat tracks temperature in the sense that the temperature goes up, the community thermal index also goes up, which implies that the thermal affinities of the species that are in the communities here in 2012 are on average much warmer than they were prior to the heat wave, say, in 2008. So this is interesting, and it, it tells us that the fish communities are responding to these unprecedented heat waves, and that they are also changing in response to the heat waves for blood health. And our question is uh, several fold, which is, is this index changing because we have more warm affinity species arriving? So they are sort of tracking this temperature change and moving down the coast in response to these warming events. Is it that we have cool water species leaving, 
which would again cause the average to go up. And so essentially they're hitting their thermal tolerance and dropping out of the community. Or as I mentioned, this is a abundance or biomass weighted index. Is it because we're changing the abundance of the resident species such that they are now tipped more in favor of say the warm affinity species than the cool ones? Again, the consequences that the index would go up. So to address this, we actually looked at the change in CTI, the change in that community temperature index between two time points. In this case, consecutive years, uh, you can imagine. So you look at it saying 2010 before the heat wave, 2011 during the heat wave, 2012 and so on. We can decompose this difference in CTI into the individual species contributions. So there's a lot of math here. Don't worry too much about it. Just recognize that for every species, we can determine whether it's on average contributing positively to that CTI or contributing negatively. And we can sum those based on those hypotheses that I mentioned to you earlier. So is it because there are more species arriving that are driving that CTI, more species that are leaving or emigrating, or is that there are differences in their relative abundances between the two periods? And so if we look at Rottnest Island on average over that entire time series that I just showed you, and we perform this exercise and parse out the community into species that were uh, arriving in one year relative to the previous year, leaving between those two years, or remaining within both of those years, we can start to answer our original questions. And in this case, we find that there's relatively little contribution of resident species to the change in the CTI year on year, which is to say that we can, we can suggest that the changes in CTI I showed you in response to those heat waves are not a consequence of the abundance of the resident species changing. Rather, it's a combination of two processes. One is that we get an influx of more warm affinity species immigrating into the system in response to these heat waves, as well as an efflux of cool affinity species that are dropping out of the system. So really, it's more about turnover in the community composition than it is in the relative abundances of these organisms in response to these changing temperatures. And what's cool about this index is that was integrated across the entirety of that time period. But as you notice, the temperature went up and then came back down and so did the CTI. So we can perform this uh, exercise again, looking at the change in CTI year on year and do these same sorts of groupings and decompose the contributions of the residents, the immigrants and the emigrants. And in this case, in the time series of uh, community data from Rottnest Island, we see again that there's really no contributions to that change in CTI year on year as a consequence of the resident species. Again, confirming that it's not really the changing abundances of the organisms, but instead the changing composition. And so we can see here in 2012, well, 2011, 2012, when this extreme heat event hit the west coast of Australia, we did see uh, a huge increase in the, the community thermal index as a consequence of warm affinity fish coming in. So the fish were tracking this change and contributing to a positive increase uh, in that the thermal affinities comprising that community. And then as the temperatures started to fall, we can see that those immigrants are contributing less and less to the changes in CTI, presumably because those local conditions are becoming less and less amenable to those warm affinity species. And indeed, there comes a point where uh, we actually see more influx of, say, cool affinity species later in the time series when those temperatures were dropping back down to more normal levels that were actually causing the community uh, thermal index to become more negative. Right, which is what's shown here. Consequently, we see a positive contribution of cool affinity species dropping out of the system, again, causing the thermal index to go up 
in the years uh, around the heat wave. Not as much as the contribution of the immigrants. So really what's developing here is a story of species that are more tropical tracking this warm water going from north to south, southern hemisphere, and changing the community composition of those uh, fish communities surrounding Rock Island. And then you can see the inverse happening as the temperatures start to cool off, which is to say that we start to see uh, more warm affinity species leaving, which causes a dip in the community thermal index. So what's really cool about this framework that we've developed over the last couple of weeks <laughs> is that it shows in sort of real time how these communities are changing, who's coming and going, and what their contributions are to this community temperature index in response to these temperature events, both extreme warm and then return to extreme cool. And this gives us some sense of what we might expect into the future as well. Who's to say that next year we won't see another similarly unprecedented warming event and the year after and the year after. And so we might keep an eye out for more of these immigrants coming in from more warmer northerly waters and potentially to a lesser extent, some of these cool affinity species dropping out. And as I mentioned before, this can have pretty substantial consequences for the ecosystem, particularly if this warm affinity immigrants are herbivorous fishes like the rabbit fish and the chub that I showed you before that are grazing down that aclonia and decimating the foundational species that form the ecosystems around Platinus Island. So it's really cool about this is that, as I mentioned, Reef Life has been performing these surveys all around the coastline of Australia. So we picked rotness or rotto, as they call it, as an example case, because we have a lot of understanding of the consequences of that really huge heat wave from 2011. But other areas of Australia are working as well. We've had large heat waves on the Great Barrier Reef, I believe in 2015 through 2017, which has led to mass bleaching events. You may have seen this in the news. And so what we are hoping to do next is scale out this framework and this test case from Rottnest Island around the coast of Australia. And in fact, this is a, from a paper that my colleague Rick Stewart Smith published last year in Current Biology, showing this uh, Delta CTI or Delta Reef Fish Temperature Index, as he called it in this paper, and how it is changing across the Australian coast in response to these temperature events. And so what we are hoping to do next is take this decomposition then and ask, is the change in the thermal affinities here a consequence of species leaving, species coming in? or changing abundance. And is that true? Uh, are, are the inferences that we have derived from rottenness, which is driven largely by an influx of warm affinity species, the same, uh, say, in the Great Barrier Reef, or in Tasmania, South Australia, Angaloo, Shark Bay, or many of the other locations around Australia that are experiencing these extreme uh, climate events. And so when I put together the abstract for this talk, I was a little bit ambitious. And I also suggest that I would speak to you about maybe the consequences of these changing compositions as these warm water species are tracking these temperature changes. We're running out of time, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a teaser. So we used these brief life data and published this article recently, looking across not just Australia, but the entire world, decomposing uh, how changing species richness and composition and abundances might lead to changes in the total biomass of the fish communities. And indeed, what we ended up showing in this paper is that biodiversity changes writ large were among the most important contributors to changing biomass across the seascape. So we had a very high biomass reef. It's likely that it contains a lot of different species. But indeed, that's, um, and please don't read into this at all. There's a lot of complicated math behind it, but just trust me when I tell you that, <laughs> that indeed it was changing composition that was among the most important indicators of changing biomass, which is to say that the loss of certain kinds of species, inordinate contributors to biomass, say large body individual sharks, groupers, rays, and so on, that are really responsible for most of the biomass changes that we see. Also the ones that are potentially most impacted by human activities like exploitation, and like climate change. 
So ultimately, as communities start to shift, species start to move around and change the composition, I would suggest that we are going to start to see increasing changes in the functionality of these communities, the total biomass, the ability of the fish communities to provide key services like herbivory. And that will have big, comp uh, big implications for both the stability and the health of these ecosystems, but also the services that we as humanity value from them, things like fisheries exploitation, uh, tourism, recreation, and so on. So to wrap things up here, climate is shifting, species are moving. I'm sure you could probably all point to examples from your own fields of research where you're finding this is true, whether it's foundational species, animals, plants, uh, microorganisms. And these shifts threaten both natural and in this case, uh, in the case of the uh, seagrass restoration, restored ecosystems. So not only are we facing threats to systems that exist, but also they may invalidate uh, all the efforts that have been made to bring some of these systems back uh, as a consequence of other stressors, things I mentioned like hurricanes. And that these uh, shifts have the uh, uh, are changing the community composition. So these pinfish are coming in and now becoming the dominant fish in these Virginia coastal bays. These tropical herbivores are coming in and becoming the dominant fish in terms of uh, the communities on this island. And we're really excited of this community thermal index as an indicator of these changes, particularly this decomposition that allows us to more precisely delineate who's responsible uh, down to a species level. And excitingly, you know, we can start to look at the life histories of each of these individual species, their trophic ecologies, other important traits, and begin to surmise what the future of these habitats might look like and the future of the services that these habitats provide both for the ecosystem itself and for human well-being. So thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to tell you about some of this exciting research, and I will happily take any questions. And questions from Zoom, too. That's no pressure on the Zoom participants. I just always forget to check the chat. It's all perfectly clear. Yes, thank you, Brian. So I I really like the, the thermal index, but I was thinking of your example at Roddy. And if you have a herbivore coming in that's changing the complexity of the system, how do you account for the loss of those species due to the loss of the foundation in your hmm. analysis? So that is a really good question. And I'm glad you asked it because I don't have it. But in, in this, this is actually a four panel figure in this paper. And one of the panels was actually the changing um, benthic structure. So they were looking at the, the cover of foundational species like corals, algae, macroalgae, kelps. And what we're hoping to do next after we do sort of Australia-wide map of these, uh, these, these different drivers of change in the community thermal index is to actually then relate it through changes in habitat. So how much of this changing uh, community composition and these affinities are in response to the habitat changing? And of course, these habitats have their own thermal affinities. Corals like it warm, <laughs> helps like it cool. And then how much of it is due to the, the species, the fish themselves responding to the temperature? So changes in their physiology and metabolism. So there's some pretty cool kind of knock-on questions that are going to arise from this. And I'm really excited to be able to have the chance to, to chase them down. It's not really an answer to your question, no, but, uh, but just, yeah, we're, we're thinking about it. Uh, just, since you got the chance to see them respond back as the temperature dropped, right? How quickly did the foundation species respond? Like, was it, did it come back or did what came back, came back to a different type of habitat than what was there before? So I haven't looked at this myself, but colleagues in Western Australia, people like Thomas Murenberg and others, have been looking at that and my impression is that these communities are not bouncing back yeah. that they recruit like like with the seagrass the recruitment processes to get these organisms back and the conditions that will promote them to become dominant foundation uh, species again take, takes time or maybe absent and so th there are definitely questions over what what, what these are going to look like are they going to be barrens uh, are they going to be just kind of Elementus algae, are we going to see the aclonia come back? Uh, the same is true for, for, for uh, coral systems. Are we going to see the large foundational corals? Are we going to see more of the kind of weedy, opportunistic 
fast growing corals, soft corals, things that are coming in and really changing the benthos of these systems, which as habitat have these knock-on effects to the fish community. So very insightful. Uh, I don't have an answer for you, but I suspect it's probably pretty important. I think we have a question all the way in the back. Yeah, so let's go back to the pinfish. Sure. I, you looked at the inshore temperature and also the, the um, I'll call it the advection mm -hmm. of the model. I'm wondering what was the contribution of the Gulf Stream instability, or also the migration of the Gulf Stream population. This, this is a very good question too. Um, so we were looking at, in, in this case, actually, we're looking at average temperatures when we believe the organisms are there. So we actually don't have good larval pinfish data from the Gulf Stream. Nobody's sampling. We believe they're out there somewhere between January and March. So we're taking the average temperature, and that was what really didn't explain much of the variance in what, what we were seeing then in terms of recruitment in the following, say, May through September. But you bring up a good point, which is variability. Um, and we haven't yet looked at that, and I think that could be an important contribution, particularly if we start to look at uh, or, or generate information about the temperature optima for, say, the larvae and uh, the temperature optima for the adults and how that, uh, whether they need, say, a certain period of time at a certain temperature or certain low temperature, certain number of days with low temperatures, high temperatures. There's a lot of interesting ways to characterize climate change. And we've really done kind of a first pass on this. I am not an oceanographer by training. <laughs> I'm a near shore community ecologist. So that's where I'm leaning heavily on my collaborators, Don Gong and Marta Faulkner, who built these models um, to help us maybe continue these investigations and understand which, if any, aspect of the Gulf Stream is influencing the, uh, the appearance of pinfish farther and farther north. And it could just be that there's tons and tons out there. Uh, you know, these are very numerous fish. They're generating lots of offspring. And it could just be that, uh, again, it, it, the recipient communities are just, or the recipient ecosystems are just becoming much more amenable to them uh, rather than any sort of population level changes offshore. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, going back to the community index, mm -hmm. um, the key, the key survive. That's the proportion of that species. Yes. Yeah. The relative biomass. So wouldn't that then uh, dominant species kind of drive that? Uh, it is not quite normalized. Yes. So that's the idea. Um, if the species is highly abundant, it's going to be driving up or down, depending on a thermal affinity, that community index. And that's sort of by design, right? Um, we want to understand how these communities are structured in nature. We can, however, just look at present absence and rerun this index. And that will give us a sense of just whether or not a species being there has any influence on this thermal index. So I think that's sort of where you're getting at, uh, which is a, a sort of different kind of question. It's whether it's there or not but it will give us a further insight into uh, maybe how these communities are changing. The reason we often weight by biomass is because biomass is generally what we're interested in in terms of fish communities. It reflects their capacity to move energy around, to keep these ecosystems healthy, uh, potentially harvestable, bio, uh, harvestable biomass, so ex exploited uh, fisheries production. And so we tend to, to err on the side of these sorts of biomass weighted indices. Thank you. Good questions. Sure. Yeah, I also thought it was really interesting to think about who's responsible for the change in the community in terms of index. So it's the incoming species that might go water, or it's the species that leave that don't like warm water. I wonder, I mean, Australia is an island, it's a continent, but it's an island. So I wonder if you look at these patterns of bouncing back after a heat wave. Think about the most northern areas in Australia, the most southern areas. You may want to, it would be possible that you chase out 
some of the species are there. There are no donors species that could come in if they all rely somehow on shallow water environments. You see that kind. So on a north, on a coastline that will has a north east, uh, north south, well, largely biogeographic bio 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 range that that would occur. But in the northern and the north southern tip of the coastline, so so far was right. And you see something like that. So this is really interesting. Um, I, we haven't run these numbers yet, so I can't tell you specifically, but I've often wondered this too. You know, as you squeeze things, they can't, if they're near shore, they need these shallow habitats. There's nowhere else for them to go other than Antarctica. And obviously they're not gonna get there, at least uh, maybe if these warming trends continue. <laughs> um, the same is true as fish vacate the tropics, as those become increasingly warm, you know, what, if anything, will be left? What will the benthos look like? You know, corals, wasps are gonna get choked out. We see some evidence of this phenomena in Japan. So that's also a small island. And we see uh, encroaching coral communities. It's actually very cool. These herbivores advance kind of in these fronts, graze down what was kelp forests, clean out the substrate, and then the coral propagules come settle and create these coral reefs. So again, they're pushing these kelps up and up the coast. And, and you're right, eventually they're gonna run out of coast and then Japan will be all corals and new kelps. I don't know if that will be the case, but these, these are interesting. I mean, that's a very insightful point and potentially something we can be looking at in a combination of both the, the CTI, but also the habitat index uh, that I mentioned earlier in response to Brad. Oh, cool. Now, now we've got some questions, awesome, thank you. So, so this is a question about what you might overlook by the way you did your analysis. And what I'm wondering is whether there might be an interaction effect between species that you identify as warm water with species that are actually tied to these inshore SAB and kelp environments. And there might be whole other suites of fish species, like some skates of things that are more open bottom things that could, for example, go into deeper water. And they might have a completely different dynamic than the than the things that, that are associated with these habitats that you love. This is an excellent point. And what's what's also important to point out is that we're talking about communities, we're talking about all the fish that are seen. So we're talking small grasses, herbivores, big piscivorous fishes, things that are eat potentially things that are eating each other within these communities. And you're right, if you exhaust the resource, then whoever's using it is also incapable of being there. Uh, that, that is a more complicated question and a more sophisticated one. Um, there are frameworks to be able to understand species interactions, um, particularly in very diverse communities where we can collapse those interaction effects into a single statistic so we're not fitting a model looking at interactions between hundreds and hundreds of species. Um, those might be something interesting to follow up on this on to get at that question. The other thing we can do and, and what the Reef Life Survey program has been um, successful at in, in the last 10 years is integrating more of that functional trait information into these sorts of questions. So habitat use, whether they're water column, whether they're benthic associated, trophic level, whether they are piscivorous or herbivorous, that will really help us understand whether the, the thermal affinities of the species are tied to their ecological roles. And that will be another interesting frontier to explore with these data. And just as a quick follow-up, I think yeah. you probably agree, there's a couple of papers that have come out, one very recently, one a few years ago, um, showing the dynamics of speciation in higher latitudes mm -hmm. along the east coast of North America. And those species that are speciating currently faster in higher latitudes they tend to be spreading out into deeper water. So they have a completely different dynamic than any of the species that you were working on. And yet they share the same coast. Uh, they're extremely abundant. They're very important ecologically, but not in SAB communities. Yes, and in fact, um, we'll get to your question as the, as the last question, but I'll just point out that we've been using these reef life data sets to look at questions of community assembly and how these communities come together. And indeed, it is those more northerly communities that have certain traits that allow them to disperse more, which homogenizes these communities more at high latitudes than low latitudes, with different implications for potential competitive interactions or trophic interactions among these organisms. So again, yeah, there's huge layers of complexity to build down, build, drill down into here. And that's, that's personally exciting for me. So I'm glad you're bringing this up because it really, 
shows that this is a cool data set to be able to use to answer these questions. Okay, last one, I believe you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if we're noticing similar migration patterns like the ones we saw in Australia, the warm water species moving into colder waters. If we're noticing those patterns here on the side. Well, that's a good question for the audience. Um, are we? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, why was it just the same for other species that they had? Just for, like, not like, Personal experience being there and being with people that have been there and it's like, oh, we've only seen one or two of these like ever, and now we're getting them kind of more often. So, Wait, what's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember specifically. It's been like one or two here and there, but it's been for you and people that you've talked about. It's also my fault to me. I just know being there with them and then hearing them and like, wow, like, they're the people who were stuff like that. I just. <laughs> Uh, like not from experience. Yeah, so uh, uh, that would be my inclination. And we do have evidence of that from the Gulf of Maine, which is slightly north of here, but is among the more rapidly warming places actually on the planet. And we've seen retraction of that kelp forest habitat that was historically sort of more southern, now going up up to down east. And change. And uh, colleagues of mine there are looking at changing fish communities in response to the retraction of habitat. So it would not surprise me to find out that Long Island is not immune from this, unfortunately. Brad's getting up, so I'm thinking that means- I'm getting up. <laughs> uh, I want to invite you guys to go over to the library uh, for some pizza and continue this conversation with